think uh, I think we can uh, get going. Um, yep. Uh, I see sure. I start to recording. Okay. So um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Nicholas Jazz. I'm the um, vice chairman for the Western Cape branch of uh, the Cement and Concrete uh, South Africa. And uh, today, um, yeah, uh, I'd like to welcome you to our Concrete Fix uh, Season Two series, Episode Seven. Um, uh, before we uh, get into the talk, um, we'd just like to acknowledge uh, our, our partner members, AfriSAM, Lafarge, PPC, uh, and Sipaku Cement, as well as our gold member, uh, Chrysa Southern Africa Group. Um, we also like to acknowledge our silver members. Um, as well as our bronze members all shown here. Um, our associate members, uh, four of them listed here. And last but not least, our academic members as well. Um, in case uh, you don't, are not aware yet, um, the Fulton's uh, or the Concrete Bible is out, uh, the 10th edition. Um, and you can uh, order this, I think, uh, through Hanley. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a quite a comprehensive book. So I'm sure it's full of lots of good stuff as the previous editions have had. And then uh, don't forget uh, the, the online magazine, uh, the latest issue, um, the September issue is out and you can find it on the uh, CCSA website uh, with this link over here. <clears throat> Um, regarding our, uh, the Western Cape branch, I thought I'd just outline the, what we have in store for the rest of uh, the year. Um, next month, uh, towards the end of October, um, we will have two PhD, student, uh, uh, PhD students from UCT who will be presenting on the research that they're doing. We have Emmanuel Leo, who will be yes, well, 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 the of... If I could perhaps just uh, ask everyone to just mute your speakers, that would be great. Um, yeah, we could just mute. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, we have Amanda Leo, who will be just discussing uh, the development of low clinker concrete, as well as the replacement of cement with African raw materials such as calcium clay and limestone and our other UCT PhD student, uh, Ichabadi Amadi, who's gonna be discussing um, uh, fine cycled aggregates um, and the use of that in concrete. And then in December, uh, the beginning of December, we will have our year end function, which will be a bit more of a social thing. I know everyone's a bit tired about not uh, having all these talks online. So we've decided that we're gonna try and organize a big get together. And that's gonna be on the 2nd of December. Um, so save the date and emails will follow. The time listed there is actually wrong, but we will update that and we will send that uh, with our invite probably over the course of next month. Uh, then um, onto our speaker for this series. Um, we, have, we have the pleasure of having uh, Rowan Hiernes from PDC um, to give his presentation. And uh, to give you a bit of background to him, he uh, studied at CPUT uh, where he got his national diploma. And um, he then started working at, for ASLA Construction uh, between 2009 and 2015. Uh, after this, he then joined Chrysler, where he worked there for three years until 2018, and is then joined uh, PPC Cement, where he's now currently the Coastal Technical Manager um, in the industry. That's it. Thank you. Um, Ron, I'm going to hand it over to you and uh, yeah, enjoy. Rowan, just remember to unmute yourself. Oh, yes. Sorry, I was muted there. I was saying thank you, Nicholas. And uh, can everyone just, can they see my presentation? 
Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Yes. So SANS 50197 cement specification and the effects it may have on plastic and hardened properties of concrete. So this topic actually came about when me and Villier had a chat and uh, there were certain questions being raised by the industry um, quite often, especially on um, cement consistency, which came up quite often and how it can actually be controlled. So we thought it good to actually do this presentation and it should have actually gone hand in hand with a tour of the factory. We would have liked to take everyone for the tour and, uh, and actually to get hold of our chemical um, and analytical people and also the chemist um, just to, to, to give you a broad overview of our cement uh, operations and so forth and just to see the, the, the magnitude of, of such an operation. For the purpose of this session, um, I follow the SANS 5019 cement specification. The writer deals with a wide range of cement, uh, of concrete designs, and is frequently asked questions that arise from the cement specification. Some things in the SANS 5019 is common knowledge, and some things not so much. Some things, sorry, I just want to get rid of this thing. Some things are looked over by the industry with detrimental effects and unknowingly. Uh, a lot of things I also didn't know before I actually started working for, for the cement company. Uh, for a long time in South Africa, we only had to deal with a handful of cements. This has changed dramatically over the last couple of years. And uh, especially in the, in the coastal region, um, we see an influx of quite a, a, a wide variety of cements. So it's not just one fits all anymore. Uh, we believe that cement is just a great father that will always give us the required or expected result. Unfortunately, this is not the case with all the cements available and questions should be asked. I hope that the session will help you to understand cement more in depth and to guide you towards what questions should be asked from the suppliers. And, and that's actually what we were, what we're going to try and do in this talk today is to to guide you towards what questions should be asked. And the question should be asked to the cement suppliers um, or where the cement comes from. Consistency in cement is the most important aspect. If cement is consistent, we can predict and control the outcome. So just the uh, cement composition, the main contributor to cement performance will be your clinker. Um, we then also add extenders to it, which can be blast from the slag, silica fume, or the lana fly ash, burns shale and limestone. Um, we then also add gypsum as a control um, to control the setting time of the cement. And then, then some minor constituents, which contributes to about 5% will be with regards to our grinding age, which we use to either improve early ages or late strengths um, and to help us with the productivity on, on grinding. So cement is categorized in five main groups, namely SEM1, Portland cement, SEM2, Portland composite cement, and then SEM3, blast furnace cement, SEM4, porcelanic cement, and SEM5, um, composite cement. This is then further broken down into 27 different products. And I'm not going to go through this whole list. The most common products that we see down in, uh, in uh, the coastal area or the Western Cape will be your Portland limestone cement, which we see quite a lot of. And uh, there's also um, the normal same one Portland cement, which has 95% clinker in there. That's the most common cement. We used to have the same three blast furnace cement. Um, that's not there. But just to point out something on, uh, on this table is that what I do see happening now, and uh, we're not going to refer to this table again in the, in the session, um, there's a, a tendency that we see in the industry that suppliers tend to start marking the cement as a Portland composite cement. And, and, and it's, a, it's a clever tactic. I mean, you can then have any of the extenders in there at those percentages and uh, you then, then just call it a Portland composite cement. Um, and then they don't need to tell you what's in there. Well, that's what they think. I've seen bags that were supposed to be marked um, properly. Um, and if you have a look at the fine print down there, they actually tell you that when you 
use the notation for a ball and compass and cement down there. Um, you should tell the uh, give all the information on the back with regards to what's in there um, and with what extender it has been extended with. So uh, just a heads up, if you see cement out there, please have a look and if it's marked as a port and composite cement, make sure that you know what's in that bag as you can then you can then predict how to use it. So another question that, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this and I'm not going to go into a lot of depth with regards to sulfate resisting cement, is that I see specifications coming through with regards to sulfate resisting cement. And um, in that specification, it says the same one is of zero. Sulfate resistant Portland cement should have a C3A content less than 0%. A SM1 SR3 sulfate resistant Portland cement should have a C3A content less than 3%. And a SM1 SR5 cement should have a C3A content less than 5 cement, or less than 5%. Sorry for that. Then it also says that you can use a sem 3 b um, which is a, a, a slag extended cement. Um, and there's no requirement on the C3A. You can also use a sem 3 c and there's no um, C3A um, extended of percentage requirement. Um, then they go further and they tell us that there's a sulfate resisting pozzolanic cement, which is the same for ASR. And there they give us a C3A content less than 9%, and the same for BSR with a sulfate resisting pozzolanic cement with a C3A clinker less than 9%. Unfortunately, none of those cements gets made in in the western cape so uh, a lot of questions arise from 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 that specification and and, I, and then you see that they need to have a self resistant cement and um luckily for us um unfortunately for us saldana closure had a big influence i mean we lost gold day i think that the, the saldana slag was, was amazing at 116 percent reactivity it did anything that was wrong in any concrete design the, the slag used to fix it um, unfortunately we don't have that leisure anymore um, so for now we the, the the solution will be as follow we do have fly ash available down in the western cape quite um, readily available and they say please we must just make sure that when we then use some of the fly ash make sure that that the 45 micron surf um, the residue is not more than 13 percent um, that will help with the reactivity of the of the ash and just make sure that it's classified as but there is very good ash available down in the western cape um, then the spec says that for us to actually produce a same for um, sulfate resisting cement we should then use a minimum of 21 percent um, fly ash so if we have a clinker that has less than nine percent c3a and we then blend it with a 21 percent um, fly ash we can then actually produce our own mix cement blend the binder blend to to make up for a sulfate resisting cement and that's what we commonly use these days and i think uh, in specifications maybe um, our engineers should, should maybe just write in there and not specify the sulfate resisting cement but rather specify a minimum blend of of fly ash um, into the into that um, concrete design then um, just things to consider um, with a flies extended cement lens, you are going to experience longer open times, um, longer curing times is needed as lower early strengths will be experienced. Um, you will find that you get a prolonged bleeding rate, um, which is not always bad, um, but definitely uh, less bleed. Um, care should be taken to prevent plastic shrinkage cracks and especially on the horizontal surfaces. We, real, we, we rarely see um, reactivity indexes of PFI at 100%. They range anything from 85% or from 80% to about 95%. And uh, for us to get to the same 28 day strength, the rule of thumb is that you should actually um, increase your CW by about 0 0.2 and you will then definitely reach that 28 day strength. Um, we see an increased strength after 28 days and we should not um, we should not take that for granted. I mean, that's valuable. Um, and we also see an increase in the durability properties. And uh, that's actually all I wanted to say about uh, sulfate resistant cement. And it uh, comes up in the 5017. It's one of the first things they discussed. And that's the reason why I also put it in 
my presentation in that manner. Then cement strength and consistency. This is one of the, the things that I actually want to get you today and the most important thing that I want to chat about. And um, a question was raised um, to me about the average strength of cement and the standard deviation. And this customer was actually quite um, worried about it. And he asked me, but, but what governs us? What stops us from dropping cement from one week to the next week um, with regards to, to, the, to our strengths? And uh, well, at that stage, I had to go to the uh, to our quality control process people and ask them, but listen, what, what does stop us? And because we, we will make, for instance, a 52.5 in cement, and it has an average strength of about 62, 63 MPA. But what happens if that thing now drops to 52 or oh, to 53, which means it's still within the specification, but it dropped to 53. How, how is the Redimix um, customer going to actually handle that? And this question was raised by a Redimix customer, which I actually do believe conforms to the SANS uh, H78 specification. And for to this uh, customers, um, standard deviation um, plays a big role, um, even on their plants. So just think about it, if the standard deviation of the cement is, is high, um, no matter what that guy does on his plant, the standard deviation is going to be high because it's contributed directly from the cement as the biggest binder and contributed to standard deviation. After he's done everything right, um, the biggest contributor then will be the, the cement. So um, hence the, the following explanation. So I had to take a snip out just from the SANS 101 and the two. Um, and just, and this is purely based on, everything is based on stats and please, I'm not a, I'm not a stats guy and I don't know how it works, but they give us formula to work with. And uh, if you read through the SANS 100, they tell us that um, the strength test results shall meet both the following acceptance criteria. No individual test results shall be more than three MPA below the specified characteristic strength. And the mean of any group of three consecutive and overlapping results shall exceed the specified characteristic strength by at least two MPA. Then they go further and they say, um, I'm not going to read all of it, but they say of um, should concrete operations of the same concrete mix be of such magnitude or sampling of such frequency that 30 or more valid test results have become available within three months, the contractor might choose to have results assessed statistically. In such a case, the average of overlapping sets of 30 valid test results for a specific grade of concrete shall exceed the specific strength by at least 1.7 times the standard deviation and no individual results are fall below the value specified. So again, it shows, it comes up again that 1.7, we had a 1.64 um, previously mentioned. And if we, if we go further and we just take a snip out from the 878, which is the ready mix specification, it also talks about a statistically controlled um, system. So they base everything they have on stats and it's exactly the same with cement. We are also governed by a statistically controlled quality control system. So, and I'm going to explain it um, shortly. So what happens, what happens with, with um, just one thing I wanted to mention here, sorry that I did not, was that they mentioned here um, three months. Okay, so if you have enough results within three months you can do more than 30, you can do a statistically controlled assessment. So it's exactly the same with cement. Just for a, a cement to be not a new cement anymore, it should be older than three months. Um, and I'm gonna show you a table a little bit later, just keep that in mind. Then I just wanna quickly go through here. Um, it also says that the average of at least 30 valid strength results shall exceed the specified strength by at least 1.64 times the current standard deviation. Um, and this is a question that should be raised to concrete uh, suppliers and, and not so many suppliers, but to concrete suppliers. I mean, there's really concrete suppliers out there that, that walks the, the mile and they actually climb the mountain to actually achieve the specification and to, 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 to do what the 878 tells us. And then there's quite a bit of them that just don't care. 
and it's it's out of control and and, and unfortunately um, detrimental to the whole to the whole industry. Um, and then just how the cement consistency can can uh, consistency can assist. So if we have a look at what the SANS 5197 says, it says under mechan uh, mechanical requirements, the standard strength. The standard strength of a cement is the compressor strength determined in accordance with the EN 1961 at 28 days and shall conform to the requirements in table three. So this is this is common knowledge. Okay, this is what people normally see, and this is what I used to know. Um, before I actually joined, was that uh, it's you have three different strength classes: so 32.5, 42.5, and 52.5. And um, well, there's a lot more to it. Um, this is, and again, the the strength is based on prism bar test and not compressive uh, concrete test. So if we have a look at what Table Three shows us, it shows us the three different strength classes. The 32.5, 42.5, and the 52.5. It then gives us the the lower limits on two days, and it then gives us the lower and upper limits on 28 days. Um, just just to see, is one thing I want to point out here. 52.5 uh, has no upper limit, hence my the reason for this this whole thing, um, where the customer asked the question. But listen, if if there's no upper limit here. At, at 62 uh, or at uh, for the 52.5 cement. That means you can make cement and you can have it at 70 MPA if you want to. And then the next the next day you can drop it down to 52.5 because that's the minimum standard. And how can anyone control that? And But there's ways to control it. Another thing I want to point out in this is that they show us, they give us initial setting time, but they only give us a minimum. Okay, on initial setting times. And then soundness and expansion, they also give us a million. I'm not gonna go into that today. Um, one thing I also want to point out that a lot of people don't see, um, and I get a question that uh, raised to me quite often is, with regards to, I get a phone call and the guy says, listen, he wants a rapid setting cement. And, uh, but he, what he wants to know is, is when he mixes this, mix this mix now with water, He's very scared that this thing is going to go off and he has no time to work with it. And what's that in minutes? If you have a look at what the specification says, we still need to give you ample time to work with it. So let's say, for instance, our product we have down here in the Wishing Cape, the sure cost 42.5, you still have ample time. We still need to conform to a minimum of at least 60 minutes um, initial set for you to work with that cement. So um, just for the understanding, it's not a rapid set, but rather a rapid hardening after setting has taken place. So you will have a, a greater strength gain curve um, than what you would have with a, with a normal, normal cement. And this is just in a diagram form, um, showing you that we have the no upper limit, um, especially on the 50.5. To control these two cements is actually a lot more difficult because you have upper limits and you have lower limits. So it becomes more difficult to actually control this. And do believe that it, 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 I, I can tell you now it is, that it is difficult. Um, then methods of testing cement. We govern by the EN1961, which is the part one determination of strength. And then the EN1962 uh, chemical analysis that goes all the way down to, to, to number seven. Um, which I'm not going to talk about today um, because we're actually focusing on, on consistency and strength. So before the explanation goes further, this is, this is a vital point for us to know. Um, cement conformity, if you have a look and you see what the word auto control testing means, and this is under point 3.7 in the 501 and 7, it says continual testing by the manufacturer of cement spot samples taken at the point or points of release from the factory or depot. So this means that's the point of release. Let's say, for instance, we 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 take cement now, we put it on a train, we take it to Bloemfontein, um, and we store it there in either a storage facility in bags or we store it in silos there. That becomes the new depot. That becomes the new point of release. So that means I should have a statistically controlled um, evaluation done from that point of release because I'm going to store cement. Whenever you're going to store cement, you're going to need to have this in place. 
So the control period, I didn't mention it here, is 12 months. It's not a calendar year, but, but it's measured in 12 months. Uh, it's the period of reduction and dispatch identified for the evaluation of the auto control test results. Um, then the specified characteristic value, characteristic value of a mechanical, physical, and chemical properties, which in the case of an upper limit is not to be exceeded, or in the case of a lower limit is a minimum to be reached. So what does that mean? And, and how do we actually use that and control that? And how do I actually help the, the customer and especially our ready mix customers to say, guys, but this is what this is what we should conform to. So what, what this says is the following. It says that um, in table six, properties, test methods, and minimum testing frequency for the auto control testing by the manufacturer and the statistical assessment procedure. So remember previously I mentioned that for a cement not to be classified as a new cement anymore, it should be older than three months. Um, and this means that for early strength and standard strength, that's our two day strengths, our seven day strengths, and then the 28 day strengths on standard strength here. Sorry, can you all see my pointer when I'm talking? That, that I'm moving over the. the um... Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. So, sorry, uh, we normally don't use uh, Zoom, so I wasn't sure that, that you can. So, if we have a look and we see, um, let's say, Let's say it's a, a new cement. We're going to be governed by column five. If it's a routine situation, we're going to be covered by column four. And this says that for every type of cement we make, we should take two samples of that cement randomly where it is dispatched. Okay, so from the point of release. So this is not grind samples. This is not internal samples that we, we need to control and still to get to this point. This is a random samples at the point of release. So that might, so you need to be very sure that whatever gets released is going to fall within the, in the specification uh, because it's random. So on the grind, you can still interplant. You still have a chance to fix it. At this stage, there's no, st there's no time to fix it. And when it's a new cement uh, and they don't have a statistical um, assessment procedure, we should make sure that, that those cements are tested four times a week. That's a lot. I mean, to do four of those, of those tests a week on random samples, that's to make up for 104 results. So you think about this. And we, you're going to understand it a little bit later um, when we go through the tables and, and why it's important. Uh, for that, two times a week, it's 52 weeks, it's 104 samples a year. Okay, so for the, for, for the statistical assessment, that's the minimum that we want. Okay, so this four times a week over three months is going to give us the same amount of samples that we've been testing them. So then what happens then is over the 104 results, whenever a new result comes in, the, the oldest result falls out. So everything on stats that's going to be determined from here onwards we're going to determine that. And I'm going to, I'm going to go through a sample where I'm going to explain this to you because I had to, I had to let them explain this to me because it, it didn't really make sense. Um, the rest of this thing, and what you will also see, it's only on your strength that we get uh, the assessment, the statistical assessment happens on variables. The rest of it happens on attributes. And you can see the, the initial set soundness, loss in ignition, soluble residue, um, all happens down on on um, uh, attributes. So just, just before we get into the actual strength and the, the example that I, I want to work through with you guys, um, again, I mentioned that this is not a concrete test. This is a mortar, mortar prism, uh, cement bar test and uh, there's a standard sand, for instance, that we buy in every, every year. Um, we buy it once a year. We stockpile it. Um, we buy in quite a lot of it. And, and you know, this, it's, it's very expensive. I think the last time I, I asked the question, it was about 30,000 rand a ton um, for that cement. Ah, oh, sorry, cement. For that uh, sand that we use. I'm, I'm not going to read through, through all of this. I just, this is just, this is within the 501 and 7 they give us that we should use this 
And then again, it says to us, um, cement to be tested shall be exposed to ambient air for the minimum time possible. When it is to be kept more than 24 hours between sampling and testing, it shall be stored in completely filled and airtight containers made from material which does not react with cement. So again, it's the case where they say to you that whenever you move your point of release, that means your new point becomes the testing point where you should be testing from. So if you ship cement, if you move cement, if, you, if you're not selling it from where out, you, let's say from out of the gate from the factory, if you're not selling it there and you're moving it into storage, whoever sells or resells that cement, that becomes the new point of release. Um, just something that I wanted to point out with regards to what, what we said in the, in the 196. Um, then just for intersex for you that, that don't know how it, it is, um, the proportion by mass shall be one part of cement, three parts of C in standard sand, which costs a hell of a lot, and one and a half part of water. And the water cement ratio is a 0 0.5. This then goes down and tells you that the uh, three test specimens shall consist of 450 um, plus minus two grams of cement, 1,350 plus minus five grams of sand and 225 plus minus one gram of water. And that's the mixture we make to actually the cost of water prism bar tests um, to test the actual strengths to, to actually measure it against our statistical control, um, auto control, and also against the minimum standard in the, in the stable three. Sorry, did anyone say something? Okay, cement conformity criteria. Conformity of cement with the requirements for mechanical, physical, and chemical properties of this standard is assumed if the conformity criteria specified in 9.2.2 and 9.2.3 are met. Conformity shall be evaluated on the basis of continual sampling using spot samples taken at the point of release and on the basis of the test results obtained on all water control samples taken during the control period which we know, now know that control period is over 12 months. So if we have a look and we see um, what 9.2.1, which they refer to, um, which I just put in there, says 9.2.2, um, in general, uh, conformity shall be formulated in terms of a statistical criterion based on the specified characteristic values for the mechanical, physical, and chemical properties are given in 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3. That's the table I showed previously. That's the minimums. The upper limit, the lower limit, the 52.5, 32.5, 42.5. That's what they're talking about there. Then the percentile PK on which the specified characteristic value is based, as given in table 7, that I will still show you. And then the allowable probability of acceptance as given in table seven down here. So what this actually means, it's the same as with the ready mix, the same as with what the, the 101 under the two um, says that they, they work this formula out on a 5% um, failure, plain failure mode. Um, and and that we all governed by that. So if, if I do not conform to that, no one else can conform to that because everyone down the line will not be able to conform to that specified uh, minimum failure uh, acceptance criteria. Then conformity evaluation by a procedure based on a finite number of test results can only produce an approximate value for the proportion of results outside the specified characteristic value in a population. The larger the sample size, the better the approximation. The selected probability of acceptance CR controls the degree of approximations by the sampling plan. And that's how they determine the following table that I'm going to show you. Just to show you there, uh, it's not a thumb suck. The control period shall be 12 months. And that's important because everything gets based on that. And consistency gets based on that. And that's why I'm hammering on that also quite a bit. Okay. So inspection by variables, just to have a look at the actual formula that we that govern us. Um, for the inspection, the test results are assumed to be normally distributed. Conformity is verified when the equations two and three as relevant are satisfied. So what it then says to us, um, X is the mean arithmetic is, is the arithmetic mean 
of the totality of the auto control test results in the control period. So that's the average, the mean value. Um, this is the standard deviation of the, of the totality of the auto control test results in the control period. So that control period, the standard deviation gets worked out over 104 results. And as you read the specification up where we said it's a new cement, it forces you to get to a, let's say, a old cement um, very quickly because within three months you will then also have the 104 results and that's all based then on your period um, and as quickly as possible for you to get there. Then um, the KA is the acceptability constant, which I will show you a table for now. Yeah, is the specified lower limit um, given in table three. That's where your 52.5 is. The 52.5 will be your lower limit. In the case of a, uh, uh, in the case of a 42.5, for instance, you will have an upper limit of 52.5 that you are not allowed to exceed. So if if we go further and we look at this table, um, the acceptability constant is the one that I just mentioned now previously, where the KA is. It's the um, if you have less than those results. So now the question was also asked to me, but what if I'm in that initial period of inducement? What do I do? How do I then do uh, and control those tests in that initial period? Well, they give us values for that. So no test statistically can be done with results with less than 20 results. So we need at least 20 results for us to actually start doing it. So for any cement to be sold, that first three months is vital. And you, as you will see here, your PK value is a lot higher at, at, at those initial stages than to where you come to the normal control where we sit at 100 to uh, uh, 149. Those are normal. That's the normal line that 90% of cement producers, at least that I know of in South Africa, um, conform to and use. So our KA value that it's used is the 1.93 because we have a cement and our cements are, are a lot older than, than the three months period. Um, so let me move on. So for this example um, that I want to work through with you guys, I just want to go through a 52.5 um, in cement sample. So what I did here is I, I, I put in values that never fails. And I actually want to prove to you that you can make a cement that never fails on the actual minimum standard of table three where it tells you 52.5, but it still fails under consistency. And it's only within five MPA. So, um, yes, now for my English, my value, um, I don't know what that word in English is. Um, you, to the customer, you I put in here 53 for the one week, 58 for the next week, 53, 58. And so I went on until I had 104 results. That means it never failed. That's mean under the lower um, limit given in table three, it never failed. Okay, but it actually did. And I want to show you that. If you do that and you go through 104 results, that will give you a standard deviation of 2.5, which is not a lot. That's actually not that bad but the average will then be 55.5 um, your ka value as as it, as, it um, as from the table above that's where i get that 1.93 because of 104 results you can use that value and then on uh, the lower limit is our 52.5 which is governed in table three i just want to quickly show you that formula again um, that's the formula i'm talking through now and how we're actually going to plot it so what they then say is you should use that formula. You should then do your calculations as I've done here, going down all the way to your 104, and then you should plot it. And this is how it looks when you plot it. And this was very interesting because I was actually arguing with one of our quality control people and said, but then it's so easy to conform to the standard. And she said to me, really? You go and do the test and see what five MPA difference does on a weekly difference between one week and the next week and how that influences your whole statistically control process and i was actually quite shocked when i started putting it in so what this actually shows is it shows the minimums of the one week 53 the next week 58 and that's what it shows the it shows you the mean value 
that we have the average there. And then it shows us the lower limit as given by table three in 50917, which means according to what I knew and what my knowledge was that that cement is fine, perfectly fine. It doesn't fail. Well, look at what it actually does. Look at the auto control value. The auto control values that we get out of that formula all fails. Every single, every single result fails after that. And that was just quite, quite an eye opener for me. So if I have such a high standard deviation, that means that my cement should actually have a much higher mean. And that said, that's it. If I was making a very inconsistent cement, I should have had a mean for this thing not to fail of at least sitting at 57, 58. Um, for me not to have failed on what I see here. Because if I have a look here, sitting at about 50, 52, okay, so it means my mean at 55 was too far too low. It should have been at about 57, 58. So um, I hope what I'm saying here now makes makes sense. Um, I, 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 did another, I did another example of a cement that actually conforms. And again, cement conforms when it's consistent. Um, what I do see out there is that the first and foremost, they don't use the EN1962 to actually test the cement. They do concrete test results in concrete labs around Cape Town. Then they, people show results to customers or engineers, and everyone just believes that it conforms. I think the question should be raised and asked, but give me this information. Let me see. Let me see this information. and Please prove to me how this thing conforms. Um, it then goes further where I did a, another set of results with a standard deviation of about one, an average of 57. It's still over 104 results. Um, this lower limit is still the same. Uh, for this example, as I said, there's no upper limit. Um, and look at this. Now you will see this cement actually um, having an average line running down there. Um, and then over time, I dropped it. So let's say, and let's say cement producers do see that, listen, it's costing me money now and, 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 and I want to drop my, my performance because of certain things. I can't just drop it from one week to the next week. I, I, I'm not allowed to do that. Okay. So if I did it over a grace period of time, I still also get to the point where I actually can't drop it any further. So let's say I started off over 59. EN result and it was constant if it was possible it's not possible to run cement at that constant line as i've done it there but you've run it for at least 33 results and then i dropped it to 57 i ran it all the way to 91 results and then i dropped it and i ran it all the way to my 104 results so i only dropped to 56 if i'm correct here so dropping from a 59 to a 56 you would see my auto control value. So I'm governed by this value. This value that's given on this line tells me that I can't drop really any further because I don't have a high enough average. I've, re I've come to the bottom where I'm, if I drop any further, I'm going to have a failure. I'm going to have a failure on my lower limit. Okay. And that governs me. So then every, any cement producer that knows what he's doing will stop, either stop there, or he will then gradually take it up to have a safe limit there um, and build in a little bit of a safety net for himself there. So again, for, for us to understand this, no one, no one, um, if, 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 if the strengths are high, no one worries, okay? Because no one's gonna have failures. Um, if an engineer, for instance, um, I do a design and it ends up on an engineer's table. And normally they ask for seven days and 28 day results. And that's what they look at and they base the, the, uh, the, the actual uh, conformity of the mixed design on, on those specific seven or 28 day results. Um, what happens if that changes dramatically, but not by the actual guy mixing it, but by the cement guy? So if, the, if your average becomes higher, it normally doesn't become a problem, okay? But as soon as it becomes lower, it becomes a problem and it becomes a problem very quickly. So it's, it's vitally important for us to understand that when controlling the cement, this 
this is the way we're going to control it. Um, I'm just, I, I see my time is running up and we actually need a lot more time. But on some main strength, you then go further and they say that you also need to conform to the 9.2.2.3 and this is by attributes. So this means if I fall in the category of 100 to 109 results, which is a full period, a full year, I may have five results below that line. This is what this says. So if I have results, but I'm only allowed to have five. If I have a new cement, I, I'm not allowed to have any under the line and, and as we go on with as the results increase. So this is the normal average that will be in the cement. So only five of those results might just, just go under that line of the lower limit that we, we discussed. And that's not the lower limit given by um, 52.5. So yes, so that's, if, if we have five of those results there sitting underneath this line here, the orange one, we are still okay and the cement is consistent enough. Um, so, but then it goes further and it says that no single result. So we must then make sure that, and, and I 100% agree, and this specification was actually written very well. Because if you then go further and you, the next question will be raised, but listen, okay, you may have five, but what happens if you, and it may be, five of them may be under 52.5, because that's just what you just now said. Um, what happens if you then drop all the way and you drop to a 40? No, we're not allowed. We're not allowed to, for a 52.5 for instance, to drop all the way to 40. For a single result, for one single result of any cement test, E in standard test that's been done on the auto control period, none of those values might ever be less than 50. Never. For that specific strength class, for instance, on a 52, and a 42, a 40, and a 32, a 30. Um, so we are still also governed by that. So actually producing cement and conforming to the 501 and 7 is a little bit difficult. Um, so you can't play around with it too much. You can't go up and down as you want to because first and foremost, as you go up and down as you want to, your SD becomes high. And as soon as your SD becomes high, your average should go up. And if your average goes up, your cost goes up. Because now we need to produce a cement consistently higher to conform to the standard. So the simple answer is that cement manufacturers or distributors are allowed to have a drop. If it does happen, the customer should be informed so that the adjustments can be made. And especially on our side, we do internal control tests and I do concrete tests in my concrete lab. And if I pick up something and you pick up a two or a three, and that's why it's important to have a, a, a good relationship with your cement supplier and actually know and the cement supplier that knows what they're doing, is that when they pick something up, they can inform you, guys, we're seeing a two, three MPA drop, please adjust your mixes um, accordingly and we can go forward. Um, unfortunately, I've seen samples of sample bags like this regularly against um, some of the things coming into our country. I've seen from week to week, eight MPA drops from one week to the next week. And this is not eight MPA on concrete. This is eight MPA on EN, EN tests. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how you, how you conform to the 501. Someone must talk, teach me how to do that. Um, um, this will make it impossible for any engineer to improve the uh, mix design based um, on such inconsistent cements and uh, hence the question that us as engineers and contractors should enforce these standards. If the, if the 10100 talks about it, uh, if the 878 talks about it, if the 50917 talks about it, it's, 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 it's for us then to make sure that it gets enforced um, into the industry. Then just a quick one on the initial setting. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. You saw, you saw that there is a minimum value um, that we need to conform to. Um, the biggest problem I have with it is that I can produce two exactly the same cements, conforming to exactly the same composition, um, but it can have, and it I can have exactly the same strength. I can make both of them on the EN sitting at 60, but they can have completely different setting times. So, and that gets governed by things like different mills, open circuit mill, closed circuit mill. It's gonna have a difference in particle size distribution, um, that's going to have an influence on your setting times of your cement. And the unfortunate part for me around this is, is, yeah, what do we look at? We look at strength. And that's what everyone is worried about. And, and yes, we your keep results. But listen, guys, what about the poor guy that needs to place that concrete? Um, and that guy that needs to, that, that has, is doing a floor now. Um, and uh, and uh, what, I've, what I did see is that uh, 
some of these guys that that resell cement, they they run out of cement. So now they are producing a 52.5 SEM 2 AL, which is a limestone extended cement. So the, the specification was only written that you should have a 52.5 SEM 2 AL. That's all. There's nothing else to it. Okay, so they, they're not doing anything wrong. But now he's, he's buying cement from me because he ran out. Okay, but now in that silo, half of it was full of another cement, which is a same 252.5 AL, and the next half of it is, is, is coming from, from us. That poor con floor contractor that's trying to time his finishing process is, 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 is on a hiding second to none. There's no way. I mean, uh, the difference is just even in our factories between setting times is, is big enough for you not to be able to use it in the same um, structure. Um, and, and, and what I see these days also happening is that people blending cement. So they, they take cement, they pump it into the silos, and you can't. You can't pump in two different silos or have two different silos and blend those cements in your trucks. How do you make sure that those, uh, that cement is properly blended, first and foremost? And if that cement is not properly blended, if you blend that cement, that cement should have a new um, LOA number. That cement should can go through this whole process that we just did now. But we allow it. We allow it in our, in our uh, uh, ready mix contract uh, silos that they can blend cement. It's not an extender. We can control an extender. It's two different cements, different setting times. Um, and uh, there's just something else quickly that I want to mention is that's very important and, and we're not going to have time for that is, is on the loss of ignition. Um, this is vitally important. We need to know how old that cement is. We need to know how much of that cement is actually hydrated. Um, and we govern by a loss in ignition of less than 5%. This just slips through. Um, what I see these days is there's sieves. They say, no, man, don't worry. It's, it, the cement is seven, eight months old. Um, it's in storage, and I'm going to sell it to you. But don't worry. You're not going to get the lumps because I'm sieving the lumps out. So they've actually built a sieve, and then they pump it into ready mix uh, um, ready mix trucks, into cement tankers, but they've sieved out the lumps. So they only serve, but they can't serve out the small lumps because it then takes too long to load it. Um, but then this doesn't get checked. So what happens if your design says that, listen, you, we're running a 25 MPA concrete water demand, 190, we're sitting at about a cement content, 250 kilograms. I've seen this a cement sample that, I've got to, that I got tested that was sitting at six, 16%, okay? Which was sitting on an LOI of 16%. That means 16% of that cement that went into that concrete mix is unreactive. It's not gonna react, okay? So that 16%, quickly comes down to I should then actually have added 40 kilograms more of that specific cement to have gotten to the same stream. But how would you ever have known if you didn't enforce this? If you didn't enforce that what's happening on the specification was was actually agreed upon. So um, that's that's me. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Ron. Very, uh, very interesting presentation. A lot of things that uh, I, I've, I've learned as well from that presentation. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, we'll open the floor to questions. Um, for those that can't um, actually ask any questions, you can just uh, pop your question on the chat group and then I can read that out um, for Ron to answer. So let's open the floor. From my side, while well, everyone is just, just first, please, if it didn't make sense, it's a lot to take in. There's a lot of formula. And, and if it didn't make sense the first time, please phone me, get on the phone. I'll come and spend time at your offices or wherever the case may be, and we can go through this. Um, there's a lot more to it that we can actually chat about and, and go through. Um, please, uh, I remember the first time when I haven't plotted myself, and done the actual calculations myself and, and, and made us cement up, it didn't make sense. Um. Uh, uh, Ron, um, I have a, a question, um, and I, I think it more comes down to um, if you have concrete production um, out in the middle of the sticks, like, you know, like some wind tower um, uh, projects that happen, 
and that. Um, they have their batching plants out on site. So does that mean now that the testing of the cement needs to happen there? Um, and no. no, 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 no. That got sold to the actual customer, um, which is the ready mix client. So that's the great part in the specification, but no, it doesn't, because that cement gets used. I mean, we supply two, three tankers a day to those silos just to keep those bases running. So there's fresh cement coming in there the whole time. Um, but if that cement, for instance, was stored there for later use for another project, yes, definitely it should be tested. Um, that cement then can't be used in a, in a different, because anytime you store cement, anytime cement gets moved and stored, the point that it gets stored at, that becomes the new point of testing. So, and the time frame for that storage is that uh, what's the time frame for that? What point is it said? Okay, now you're storing no, the cement. No, no, it doesn't. The, the specification doesn't say anything with regards to that. If you become a reseller, if you have cement and you become a reseller or a depot, that becomes the that becomes the new point. Okay. So you can either be a cement producer, or you can be a cement importer, storage facility and sell it. Let's say, for instance, the country doesn't have a, a cement plant. Um, and the right that is going now, the, the imports are killing us. But um, let's say there is no, no cement plant anymore. Then wherever the cement will come into on our harbors and get stored, those stored points will then be governed by the 50197, or is supposed to be covered by the 50197. Okay, thanks. Any any other questions? Uh, you can raise your hand as well in the group and I can open up. Otherwise, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Drone, it's uh, John Roxbury here. Um, I, 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 it's something that I've missed out. Point of release is a fantastic thing um, to use now for. Um, for, uh, the, we've got to tell people about the point of release. Is there a definition? Where is that defined, the point of release? Okay. You, know, you, uh, you defined it for us, but um, where is it defined? I, uh, John, I will go back to the specification, okay? In the 50197, and I would love to go in, and I, as you say it now, I should have actually just see if they didn't mention it somewhere. Um, no, they just they just say auto control testing and then continual testing by the manufacturer or cement spot sample taken at the point of release from the factory or depot. So that means it's a factory or a depot. So if you're going to resell it, you're either a depot or you're a factory. Okay, so it self defines it there. Okay, yes. brilliant, brilliant. Okay. okay, thank you. Does that make sense, John? Yes, yes, it self-defines it. Yeah, so I, okay. I think we must use that more in this country. We no, must definitely. talk about that more. That yes. uh, you know, has your has your cement been tested from the point of release? Yes, and show What's us, that? show yeah. us. Don't just tell us that this conforms to the five hundred one and seven. Please, we don't believe it. Show us. Yeah. Good. Uh, Ron, uh, another question I actually have. Um, you mentioned this uh, CEN uh, standard sand uh, that's yeah. used for the mortar tests, and that's to evaluate um, whether or not you get you can achieve the strength criteria that's required for these cement um, yes. you So you say that so there's no sands in South Africa that you are well that uh, conforms to this uh, this requirement, the CEN requirement. So you have to import. We we, we actually buy it from France. Um, we buy about seven tons a year of, of that coming in um, just for our control and, and testing. You know? So it's, uh, and you can, you can either buy it in Germany or you can buy it in, in, in France. And I, I can promise you 98% of the world's cement producers buy that sand and it comes from either France or Germany, 98%. So for us to keep something consistent, we can't just go and, and this is what I have a big problem with. So I, and I, I wish I could mention names, but you can't. Um, you get cement and tested in concrete, which gets tested with natural aggregates, natural dune sand, which varies. Okay, first and foremost, um, completely.
completely different plastic properties, absorption rates, and, and all of that, okay? Um, but then they want to say that, listen, the cement performs good. It's impossible for you to say that. It's impossible for you to analyze cement on one result. I don't know how someone can do that. I don't know how you can do that based on one result. Because just if you go and analyze a red mix plant's results, just go and have a look how much it varies from one week to the, other, to the next, if they are really and truly honest about it. How the hell do they still control inconsistent cement? Impossible. Yeah, sounds yeah, sounds very difficult. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? I see we are three minutes past four, so I know we're past our um, allocated time there. Um, so is there maybe one last question anyone has? No questions. Nicholas, can I just then, if there are no other questions, can I just ask from an administrative point of view that the um, attendee identified on you as Galaxy J7, that you, that you just please identify yourself just for the sake of our attendance register. We don't know who you are. The attendee Galaxy J7. Please, would you just um, identify yourself? I see there's also a, a Galaxy Note 10. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit noisy. <laughs> We're selling cell phones now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Um, maybe they can just put their name in the in the chat there, and then we can, um, you know, and then we can maybe just capture that. Please, if you wouldn't mind putting it in the chat, so Natasha can just have a fair. Uh, we... Yeah. Guys, would you just please mute yourself if you're not actually speaking? Um, so please put put your names in the chat so Natasha just have, can have a true reflection of who's attending. We also need this for the CPD verification. Please, Galaxy Note 10 Lite and the Galaxy J7. Thank you. Um, I think the Galaxy J7 actually left. <laughs> yeah. And, and sorry, can uh, Brendan's iPhone, I also don't know who you are. Nicholas, it seems like we're not going to yeah. get any other joy, so it's back yeah. I think Thank you. Okay, no worries. Okay, well, um, uh, Rowan, uh, thanks very much for that uh, very interesting presentation. Um, as I said, very interesting. Um, and yes, also thanks to uh, everyone for coming to watch the presentation as well. Only a pleasure. That's good. Okay, well, great. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for coming. And uh, yeah, keep loving concrete <laughs> and cement. <laughs> yeah. It, it goes hand in hand. It goes hand in hand.